How do you assess the Congress's countering of this entire Modi wave? Uh, we do know in terms of social economic indicators, for instance, there hasn't been as much progress as it's been glorified to be. Why has there not been a more specific and strategic um, just fact sharing on what the reality is of that state? First, let me modify your question to say I'm not sure there is a Modi wave. Uh, Yes, but there is certainly a resurgence in support for the BJP, which may be taking them in the direction of their best performance in the past, or possibly just past it. I don't describe that as a Modi wave for the very good reason that we have to remember where they're starting. Don't start at 272, where they would cross the mark, the halfway mark. Start at 116, where they are today. And ask yourself, how many seats are they going to add in which state? And then you'll come up to the obvious, the most obvious feature of this election, which is that the BJP is very far behind in Uttar Pradesh. It's at position four as, as to go by the assembly elections of just last year. They were behind the Congress. So now they have to overtake not just the Samajwadi party or Mayawati, they even have to overtake the Congress to get to any kind of respectability in UP. And in Bihar, they have never been tested. They got to where they got because of their alliance with the JDU. And uh, the JDU got formed at a time, or, or rather came into some kind of prominence at a time, when Lalu's stock was definitely going down. So you had a situation in which they did pretty well, but in an election in which the overall trend was anti-Lalu rather than pro-BJP. So the BJP propagandists can say what they like. In fact, I was very amused to read a headline that uh, Jetli, Arun Jetli had said that uh, if Goebbels were here, he'd be a member of the Ahmadmi party. And my response is only by being a defector from the BJP. Because their party is full of Goebbelses who talk utter nonsense about their future prospects and all of whom are gloating at the prospects of themselves becoming ministers. And I'm looking forward with great keenness to the 16th of May of this year when we'll ultimately be able to throw mud on all their faces. So I don't buy this concept of a Modi wave. But what, uh, is, what is true is that opposition to Modi in Gujarat by the Congress party has been extremely deficient from the year 2002 or possibly even earlier. Why? It's because casting around after Chivan Bhai Patel, a man of many virtues and alas several vices, we were not able to find a leader there other than Shankar Sin Vagela, whose background was that of being a comrade in arms of uh, Narendra Modi. And therefore there was, I think, an ineffective response to them in 19 in 2002 and a decision as the campaign went along that people who were secular fundamentalists like myself should be kept out of the campaign and Muslim leaders from the Congress party I know at least one who was asked six times on his way to the airport to perhaps postpone his departure so somehow that communal wave that was unleashed by Modi also lapped at the shores of the local Congress party. And ever since then, they have been very circumspect about attacking Modi personally. But the Gujarat story, as projected by the Goebbelses, is a Modi story. So if you won't attack Modi, and you won't attack Modi's ideas, and you won't attack Modi's models, and Modi's eccentricities, and Modi's authoritarianism, and Modi's arbitrary ways of running a government, and Modi's depriving very poor people of uh, their assets in order to benefit 
the Adanis of the world is not only Adani. LNT has hugely benefited. Tata has hugely benefited. So if you don't take him on as your enemy number one, then naturally you're allowing him political space. What Kejriwal has done in the last two or three days, I highly approve of. Because for him to list out by name villages that haven't received electricity, to expose the Goebbelsian lie that every village has 24 hours electricity, to show that several benefits have not reached the people, although the claim is that it's such a well-administered state, and to pretend that development consists of making Tata richer instead of making people have a better life. I think all this has been very effectively exposed by Arvind Kejriwal, and I commend him for it. Kejriwal's attack on the connections of uh, big corporate houses like the Ambani's and uh, the Adani's is to politics altogether. I mean, you know, therefore, automatically included in his ambit is anyone who has run a government and automatically excluded from his ambit is parties that have never run a government like his own. His attack is therefore, when it comes to Ambani or Adani, certainly on Ambani, it's much more on the Congress than on Modi. And on Adani, it is much more on Modi than it is on the Congress. I am glad he has raised these issues because I do believe that the influence of corporates on governance is something that needs to be understood, appreciated, studied, and regulated. Very, very important. Because in all democracies in history, the corporate sector has always played a nefarious role, particularly at approximately the stage of industrial development that India is today going through. Because it's only at this stage that some corporates become gigantic. The IT sector in India is becoming increasingly political. And the kind of letters that Aziz Premji and, and um, Mr. Narayan Murthy dash off to the Prime Minister, the role of the CII, uh, the, all these are warning signals to us that if our democracy becomes a puppet of these uh, forces, then we could go the Hitler way. What virtues does that man have? Name one. I'll change the interview now. You answer my question. Name one virtue that Amit Shah has. He is a manipulator. He, is a, he has a filthy reputation. His role as home minister is under a cloud. And in these circumstances, if he wishes to use in Uttar Pradesh the methods that he has perfected in Gujarat, well, I think the people of Uttar Pradesh are wise enough to know that uh, he's not their man. The BJP is concentrated in four states of India. Rajasthan, Gujarat, Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh. These are contiguous states. But the country has 29 states. Where is the BJP in 25 of them? And don't forget in the democratic system, every time you get one vote more than your, the chap you're defeating, the runner-up, the vote cannot be converted into seats. So if you get 70% votes, it doesn't move into more than one seat in that constituency. And you can't transfer votes from one constituency to another. And therefore, if you have a concentration of support in four states, instead of like the Congress, a dispersal of support over 29 states, you suffer a lot of your votes not translating into seats. But as you said earlier, their focus seems to be on Uttar Pradesh to increase their tally from 10 to, they're hoping, over 50. That's, that's for mathematical reasons. And, and because they put Amit Shah in charge, so the kind of campaign that they're running also seems to be reflecting. quite reflecting. And therefore, I don't see them getting any support in either Western Uttar Pradesh or Eastern Uttar Pradesh, where there are large minority communities, <coughs> or many pockets of central Uttar Pradesh. Also, I think the emergence of the Ahmadmi Party, which played the role of Horatio. Now, maybe some of your viewers wouldn't know what Horatio did. But when Rome was attacked by the barbarians, 
there was only one bridge over the river Tiber and they were to pour in across this bridge and get into the citadel of Rome. So Horatio and two of his friends stood three abreast on that bridge and repeatedly fended off the barbarian attackers. And this is there in Macaulay's famous poem on the lees of ancient Rome. So I described Kejriwal as Horatio standing on the Jamna, stopping these barbarian BJP Wallas from capturing the citadel of India, that is Delhi. Now, at that time, it looked as if he was going to be able to make a mark in a slightly, in a radius, at least around Delhi. But while there's some signs, some signs uh, of uh, a presence in Haryana, there doesn't seem to be any in Uttar Pradesh. That surprises me. An aside that you'd made about the, your chai wala comment has given rise to this. Yeah, I never use that word. So could you no, please no, tell I us never, what happened? I have to insist in this. Yeah. I never use that word. Could you please tell us? And I never referred to it in a derogatory manner. Who is the one who has brought into the political discourse at almost every occasion that he can say so, that he was uh, distributing tea or serving tea at some distant point in his life. It's Mr. Modi, who is attempting to prove his credentials as an Aam Admi by claiming that his origins are that of an Aam Admi and counters every criticism of his close nexus with very, very khas Admi by saying that I am a humble man of humble origin. What I said was, the man has proved his total incapacity to be the Prime Minister of India by not knowing that Alexander never went to Patliputra, by not knowing that Takshila is in Pakistan and Nalanda is in India, by not knowing that the transaction tax he talks about is Caldor's discredited idea of an expenditure tax, which goes back 70 years or so by showing no understanding of the constitution when he wants to convert what is a race for each constituency into a presidential challenge on his part to the Congress party. So I said a man who knows no history, knows no economics, knows no law, knows no constitution and is responsible for the kind of outrages that took place in Gujarat in 2002 that he doesn't deserve to be the Prime Minister, that he's not worthy of being the Prime Minister. But, I said, referring to his own credentials, which he himself has created, if he wants to serve tea, we'll give him a stall here. <laughs>